Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And if you haven't felt welcome here, we welcome you. And it is our prayer that no one will leave this service wishing they spent their time elsewhere. Our scripture lesson today is taken from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and it reads like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the live coal in his hand, which he had taken with thongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. I was just going. What's the worst that could happen, right? Kind of a silly video, but kind of does uh, describe what most of us have in our minds of what's going to happen if we ask somebody to come to church with us. Um, today's sermon is based on Isaiah chapter 6. And it's about calling. 
It's about God's calling. God's calling on a prophet. Also, God's calling on pastors. God's calling on evangelists. God's calling on missionaries. And if we are born again, if we are children of God, if we have experienced salvation, it's also God's calling to us, all of us, in sharing the good news that has happened in our lives. God's calling to us for service. Now, 80% of the people that go to church wind up going to church because someone has invited them. The problem is that not many people, only a handful, ever invite anyone else to church with them. I would not be standing here. Lillian and I would not be in this church if it wasn't that over 30 years ago, somebody invited Lillian to a little church in Buffalo Street in Whitehaven. That's the power of your invitation. We kind of joke with the video, right? He has all these uh, imaginations of what would happen if you invited someone to church. But like I said, God has a calling on different people in different ministries, but he has a calling to all Christians to share the good news. So we're going to get into this chapter. It's, it's going to be a little different. It's going to be talking more about uh, uh, um, some of the happenings that happened back in the day of Isaiah and also uh, on some of the things of ministry in the church and how we should, we should um, conduct that. And so let's just start right off with chapter 6, the, the scripture that, were, that was read today. And I'm just going to read a small part of the first verse that says, In the year that King Uzziah died. And I'm going to stop there for a second. Because there's so much to unpack in those few words. When you uh, look into the history of what was going on in in Judea or in the Jewish Hebrew people at the time, um, King Uzziah was king for over 50 years. Could you imagine that? King for over 50 years. That's like saying we have the same president from 1970 to 2020 for all those years. Could you imagine that? Um, just recently, this, this week, uh, Queen Elizabeth the, the, second, the, the second or the third? The second, right? Charles is the third. Queen Elizabeth II um, passed away, and she reigned for how many years? There are people in England that never knew another monarch. You know? And so we see here that, that the Bible tells us, it begins with this, in the year that King Uzziah died. And King Uzziah was a good president, oh, president, a good king to a certain point. He, he took care of the country. He, he created uh, aqueducts and waterways. Now, you may say, well, that's no big deal. But if you live in a desert area, that's a very big deal. He built cities. He, he built all kinds of, of, of structures and, and um, gained land for the Israelites or the Judean people. But there were two things that were going on in King Uzziah's life that were wrong. The first one is that he went into the temple and burned incense to the Lord, which was the job of the Levites, of the priests. And it says that immediately he got leprosy. And another thing that King Uzziah had is that he allowed, he permitted high places. What are high places? High places were these places where people would worship. But they wouldn't worship God because the Jews believe in only worshiping God at the temple. So these were places of worship of false gods, of, of gods of the other countries, the, the gods that, that, that um, required human sacrifices and baby sacrifices and so forth. And so uh, this created the pattern to where now um, um, King Uzziah dies and the, the Judea, uh, Judah starts going down spiral, downhill. The people are 
Um, they're panicking. They're panicking. You see, it, it makes a point. In the year that King Uzziah died, like people that were reading that would know. That means nothing to us. But let me put it this way. If I say the year 2001, 9-11, right? Today is, is the anniversary of 9-11. And, and so that's seared. That's um, burnt into our psyche, into our minds, right? We remember that. I don't know how many of you, I could still see the news reports. I could still see the planes flying into the building. It's like fresh in my mind. It's hard to think that it's 21 years already that, that, that that's happened. But those are events that we can mark history by, right? If I tell you that, you know exactly where you were, what you were doing. So when the, this chapter opens up with, with, in the year King Uzziah died, since he was such a long-term and good king, you knew instantly what Isaiah was referring to. What year, what time, what date. You knew where you were when this king passed away. I mean, yeah, I mixed that date up with, um, with 2020. If I say 2020, for some people, they know that that's the year that the world shut down. And everybody got locked up, right, without committing a crime. We all got locked up. But those years are seared in our minds, and we remember them. And that's, that's the point that I'm trying to bring here. When, the, when this chapter starts with that, the people instantly could relate to what Isaiah was saying there. And so that brings anxiety. Like right now in England, I mean, they are anxious. Here's a person that's been a queen for 70 years, and now they have a new king. They also have, at the same time, what? A new prime minister. So people get anxious at times like this. It's like, what's going to happen to our future? You know, what's going to happen to our income? What's going to happen to our economy? What's going to happen to, the, to our nation? You know, we've seen where the wrong leader could bring disaster to a nation. We're witnesses of that now. And so the people of England got to be thinking about that. And this is the mindset. This was the reality of the people of that time that Isaiah was called to preach to. So are you getting the picture now? Does it relate to us at all? And so it starts with, in the year the king Uzziah died. Those simple, what are those? Seven words have so much packed in there. But as the people are panicking, and as the people are having anxiety attacks, let's read the rest of the verse. He said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So despite who comes into power, despite who's sitting on a earthly throne, who sits on the throne of all the universe? God Almighty. See, you may have the wrong structure and you may have the wrong leadership and you may have a, a confused leadership, but remember this, God is never wrong. God is never confused, and God is seated on the throne of all creation. You can be sure of that. And then the other thing he says here, and I saw the train of his robe fill the temple. A little history. Back in the day when kings conquered another nation, they would cut a piece of the robe of that king that they conquered and have it sewn to their own robe as a trophy. You know, it's like, nah, 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 you belong to us now, right? And it was a trophy. And the more countries they would conquer, the longer the robe. And the longer the robe, the more important you were. This is, that, that even carries on into, into modern time, right? Where we see a wedding and we see the bride with a train, right? And, and um, that signifies that that person is the most important person in that day at that time. 
Right? The bride is the queen for the day. And Isaiah sees God with a robe, signifying that he is an important one. But it's not a robe with patches on it, and it's not a robe for just one day. It's a robe that fills the temple with God's presence and glory. How awesome would be to see something like that. And then it says in verse 2, Above him were seraphims, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with the other two wings they covered their feet, and with the other two wings they were flying. Seraphims, or what we call angels, right? These things were not these little chubby babies with little wings and little bow and arrows or harps, right? That is Greek mythology. Listen to me carefully. Those pictures are Greek mythology. They're not biblical. There's other places that describe what these seraphims look like. The seraphims look like a serpent with six wings. It's amazing what we create in our times and in our minds. And with these uh, six wings, they covered their eyes. I guess they covered their eyes to not gaze upon God's holy glory, right? And the other two covered their feet so they wouldn't trample what is holy. And with the other two, they flew. And, but this is the thing, verse 3. As the seraphims flew around the throne of God, they yelled out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. So the people are full of anxiety. The people are wondering what's next. God is on the throne. And now you have the witnesses of the angels saying that this Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit is on the throne. Three holies for the triune God. Verse 4. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts shook and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. What a sight. Could you imagine? Amazing that this person, Isaiah, is witnessing this. And things are shaking. Could you imagine if we start shaking now, right? It would be an earthquake probably, right? Blame it on the earthquake. But if things start shaking now, could you imagine if this place would get full of God's glory and we would witness the smoke of God moving among us right now? Did you know that that same God that the angels yelled holy, holy, holy about is here right now? He's here because we believers carry him in our hearts. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus himself testifies to this by saying that wherever there are two or three gathered in my name, there I am with them. God's presence is here. I remember back in, um, I think it was 90, 97 or 99, there was an event held by a group called Promise Keepers, which was a Christian uh, men's organization. And they had this event called Stand in the Gap, where, where millions of men, Christian men, gathered at the mall in, in um, Washington, D.C. Now, the mall is that big grassy area that goes from the Capitol to, to um, the Washington Monument and to the White House. And that mall, that whole distance, was filled shoulder to shoulder with men and um, we had all kinds of representation there. There was uh, the Native Americans had their chiefs, Christian chiefs in full garb uh, there. The, the Jewish Christians had rabbis there with so shofars. And when they began to blow into those shofars, which are horns, ram's horns, and they began to blow into those horns, all the men fell on their face, on the grass. 
And I tell you, I didn't see it with my eyes, but I could feel it. I could feel a cloud coming down upon that group there, just all among us, with us, moving through us. This is what we should be feeling as the people of God when we get together like this. No matter how small the group, because the promise is wherever there is two or three. We're way past that today, my friends. We should be feeling God's presence here today in a mighty way. Let that cloud move in you. Let it move through you. Let it move through these aisles. Let it move through your heart. God wants to do something special in your life today. Let him. Let him. At that moment, when Isaiah saw all these things, we jump to verse 5. He says, woe is me. <laughs> or woe to me. Now, he wasn't riding a horse. So he wasn't like, whoa, horsey. Right? We don't use that word much. How, how many times do you use woe? Huh? Yesterday? Anybody use woe? No? Woe, right? Woe here signifies a sorrow. It signifies distress. It signifies trouble. And when the prophet sees the sight of God sitting on the throne, of his robe filling the temple, of the smoke of his glory, the post shaking and trembling, the angels glorifying God. As he witnesses this, he's like, I'm done. I'm a dead man. Because as a Jew, he would have studied and understood that at the presence of a holy God, men die. In the temple, for the sacrifices, once a year, the high priest would go in to do the sacrifices in the holies of holies. And if he had any offenses on him toward God, he would fall dead. As a matter of fact, they would tie a rope around his waist and bells. So when the bell stopped ringing, it was time to he-ho, get him out of there. Somebody get the defibrillator. And Isaiah sees this. He understands that maybe he's, uh, he's not going to be able to withstand this. But listen to what happens next. Then one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from, with tongues from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, and your guilt has been taken away, and your sin atoned for. Why was that? Because he confessed in the last part. He said, uh, um, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. He recognized himself. He recognized his condition. And now God, as he repents of his condition, God does something to purify him. This is significant. The coal from the altar. What was the altar? The altar was where the sacrifices were made. For what? For the forgiveness of sins of the people. It was a symbol of what would happen with Jesus Christ eventually. Where he would be sacrificed on the altar of the cross. Now, how many of you are thankful that when we confess our sins to God, he doesn't have to burn them away with a hot coal, but he cleanses us with the cleansing blood of his son, Jesus Christ. See, that's the, that's the, 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 the symbolism there of this coal. God was cleaning purifying Isaiah's lips and mouth. Why? Because that was the instrument through which God was going to use him. So he gets his lips clean. He gets, um, he gets his mouth attended to. Um, as we enter verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom 
shall I send? And again, another re reference to the Trinity. Who will go for us? We did the Trinity this morning, Sunday school. He says, whom shall I send? Now, here's Isaiah. He's seen this, this great vision. that He's seen the angels worshiping God. The angels were worshiping God. They, were, they weren't talking to God. They weren't talking to Isaiah. They were talking to each other, worshiping God. God had not said anything till this point. And all of a sudden, God speaks up. And God says, whom shall I send? One of my pet peeves, one of my pet peeves, this is me, this is Joe, right? Um, I'm not of the school of grabbing somebody right out of the street that has not had a saving experience with Jesus Christ and putting them in a post in the church. That bothers me. And as we, we go into the explanation of this calling into ministry, we're going to see how that plays out. I remember years ago there was a pastor and he, his worship team was struggling. And in order to have a worship team that sounded right or well or good or whatever, he went and hired a cabaret player, a guy who played in bars in the weekend, so he could have professionally sounding music. Well, that not only almost split the church in half, it turned out to be a disaster afterwards because this guy would show up on Sunday morning with bloodshot eyes, the smell of liquor all over him, and a hangover to lead God's people in worship. I don't know about you, but that bothers me. Those are the experiences I've had with this kind of mentality. Why do I say that? Because there are principles to the call to ministry. There are principles to the call to ministry. And I'm going to go over these real quick. I'm running short on time. But the first one is this. If you could get that first one up. Is veneration before activation. Veneration before activation. See, we first have to recognize who we are. That we're sinners. We're fall, fallen from grace. And that we need God to cleanse us. That we need Jesus. And then we can be activated to serve and to be used by God and in his church. The second thing is realization before visualization. Realization before visualization. We need to realize our gifts, our talents, before we can visualize ourselves doing them. I think it's important. I've, been, I've had the experience of people tell me, Pastor Joe, God's talked to me. He wants me to sing in the worship team. I said, okay. Do you know how to sing? I sing in the shower. And then you try them out, and it sounds like a cat getting his tail run over by a rocking chair. It's not to be mean, but if we're giving God the best, we should be giving God the best. Right? I mean, I've had people, I've seen in churches where people are like, well, well I, I want to be the greeter. I want to welcome people when they come into the church. I want to give the bulletins out. I want to be the greeter. But I hate people. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Don't hug me. Stay away. You know? You threw your bulletin in the garbage last week. I'm not giving you one this week. <laughs> Come on. Do you really got the gift to do that ministry? 
You see what I'm talking about? Realization before visualization. Before you could see yourself doing it, do you have the gifts from God to do it? Or are you just a warm body in the spot? Now, that's hard for me to preach here in a place where we have very little to pull from and very little volunteers that help. You know, there was a survey done recently that said that the more you involve children in charitable um, um, duties and, and things, getting them involved in food pantry as children, they become adults that get involved in doing charity. But today and day, what we have are children who never get involved with anything outside of their computer games. And so we wonder, what's happened to our organization? Um, my friend who runs another food pantry, they're in their 70s and 80s running that food pantry, and they can't get anybody in their 30s to help. It's a whole other generation. Okay, the third point. I'm dragging these a little too long. The third point, consecration before confirmation. Consecration before confirmation. Now, what do I mean by that? First of all, we have to be dedicated, seek God for the direction in which he wants us to go in a particular ministry. And that has to come before the confirmation. And where does the confirmation come from? I'm not talking about you getting dressed in a white dress and, and reading a, a certain bunch, a bunch of books and then being able to do a ceremony and then leave that place and say, well, I'm good for the rest of my life now. Confirmation it comes from the body of believers, from the church. The church is not some major organization. The church is us. The body of believers. Listen, the story of Paul, Saul, right? He was Saul. He was the persecutor of the church. He killed Christians. And he was on his way to kill more Christians to the way to the, on the road to Damascus. And that's when Jesus, the resurrected, glorified Jesus, came and showed himself to Paul knocks him off his horse. And when Paul saw that, he said, Who are you, Lord? And recognized him and repented. And God changed him instantly. God said, You are my servant that I'm going to use to send to the Gentiles. Right? So when Paul got up from there, did he go and start preaching the next day? If you read your Bible, no. What did Paul do? He went back to the church. And he learned from the people in the church. And he was trained by the church. And when time came for him to do what God had called, God called him to do this, right? This is God's calling on his life. But yet he did not set a foot forward until the church came around him and confirm that this is God's calling on your life. We have something like that in our Free Methodist Church, right? We, we, we take these courses, we, we, we have experience, and then we go on the day of, of, uh, of uh, our annual conference, and we stand up there, and the whole group stands around us and prays for us. The church recognizes that this is God's calling. It's confirmation that we have been consecrated for this particular position. So consecration before confirmation. So we have the calling, we have the consecration, and then we have the confirmation. These are the three major points or principles of ministry. Is that video there? Play that video, please. Here on. 
Ele fala. So God asked the question, God asked the question, whom shall I send? And as you heard in that video, in many different languages, many different people answering that call to be Jesus to those around them. God calls pastors, calls missionaries, calls evangelists, calls prophets, but God calls all his children to be witnesses for him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, that your calling is real and your calling is um, powerful. And you confirm what we can do you call us to do things that no one else could do. Why? Because a person that doesn't know Christ can't tell someone else that Christ is the Savior or that Christ saved them if they didn't experience it. We have experienced Christ as Savior. We have experienced the love of God. Help us, Father, as your people, to understand that we have this calling upon our lives to share your love, your grace, your mercy, and your gospel with those around us, even in troubled times, even when the world feels like it's falling apart. Help us to be ambassadors of your love. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Jesus.